Our first scripture lesson this morning is from the first chapter of Genesis, verses 26 through 31. Then God said, let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food, and to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Our second reading is from the Gospel of, according to Luke, chapter 8, verses 22 through 25. One day he, that's Jesus, got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they put out, and while they were sailing, he fell asleep. A windstorm swept down on the lake, and the boat was filling with water, and they were in danger. They went to him and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he woke up and rebuked the wind and the raging waves. They ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? They were afraid and amazed, and said to one another, Who then is this? that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him. May God bless these words to our understanding of his blessings for us. Good morning. Some of this you already know but I've been asked to introduce, and it's my pleasure, Dr. Mark Norris. He is a professor of bio biological sciences at Stevenson University. For us older members of the congregation, that used to be Villa Julie College. He has taught college level biology and environmental sciences for the past 15 years, not at Stevenson University, but for the last several years at Stevenson. Before that, he was in Minnesota. He also studies the impacts of non-native tree pests and how people affect the forest along the urban-rural gradient. His professional pursuits are largely influenced by the time he spends outdoors, hiking, camping, climbing or hugging trees, and playing disc golf. This must be an age thing because I don't know what disc golf is. <laughs> He's married to Epworth's administration assistant, Clara, and they have, I must say, two beautiful daughters, May and Sophia. If you get a chance to see them downstairs, give them a very warm welcome. And Mark, if you want to come up, wherever you are, there he is. Good morning. Thank you, John. So let's see if this will work. Okay, there we are. So, um, as John said, I'm, so I have an environmental science degree, and but I've been trained through my graduate schooling as an ecologist, and uh, what that means is I study how nature 
works. And so this semester, uh, let's see, the, the two uh, college age kids are my research students, and um, we're exploring how uh, restored wetlands at a local nature center, how they work, what kinds of things are taking advantage of those of those new wetlands. And, and on this particular day, we also had, a, had a, um, an opportunity to kind of share what we were doing with uh, some of the preschool classes there, which was a, which was a lot of fun. Um, one of the ways that I describe why I do what I do is through this word. So I'm, I consider myself an ecologist. The word ecology, comes from the Greek root oikos. Oikos means home. So ecology then is the study of our home, trying to understand how our home works. Um, economics comes from the same Greek root, which means then the management of our home. So for me, as a Christian, as an ecologist, it's important that we understand how our home works in order to be good stewards of that, of our home. So Pastor Terry asked me to talk to you about uh, creation care or Christian stewardship of God's creation. And to do this, I'm thinking about, uh, or I have my uh, kind of message outlined into th kind of three main pieces. And the first piece is about our perspective. And uh, so some of you might be familiar with this photograph. This was taken by the Apollo 8 astronauts in um, 1968. Astronaut Bill Anders took this photo. Um, this was Christmas Eve, 1968. They had just entered Earth orbit, or I'm sorry, lunar orbit, and they got to see the Earth coming up over the horizon. And if you get a chance to listen to the audio from this, it's really kind of fascinating because they're arguing about um, where the color film is and who has the better perspective to take the better picture. <laughs> this picture has gotten a lot of credit for changing our perspective of Earth and our role on Earth. Um, it's sometimes considered the most influential picture ever taken. It's around the same time in the late 60s, the quality of our environment was rather poor. And this is around the same time that the Clean Air Act was, uh, was written and enacted the Clean Water Act, the first Earth Day was two years later, the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, uh, came into being two years after this as well. So this was a really important time of growing awareness of our earthly home. So fast forwarding almost 50 years, this is astronaut Scott Kelly. Uh, he has an identical twin brother, Mark Kelly, um, and they both participated in this unique experiment. Scott Kelly, this one, he spent almost a full year in the International Space Station to study how the body responds to that environment, comparing how his body was reacting compared to his identical twin who was on Earth for that period of time. Uh, they're doing this in preparation for what we think might come in the future, going to Mars or elsewhere. In other words, spending a lot of time in space. And Scott Kelly's perspective here changed as he spent all that time in, in space. Uh, he says, the more I look at Earth, the more I feel like an environmentalist. There are definitely areas of the Earth that's covered with pollution all the time. There are weather systems that I've seen while I was up there that are in unexpected places. Storms bigger than we've seen in the past, and this is definitely a human effect you can tell that this is not a naturally occurring phenomenon. So I think we sometimes need a different perspective. Unfortunately, we can't all get his perspective. Um, so we have to <laughs> do our best to expand what, what we are able to. My childhood pastor, who was also my dad, um, <laughs> used comics as a regular part of his ministry. And in fact, few sermons went by where there wasn't a comic strip in, in there. And uh, I really liked the perspective 
of Calvin and Hobbes here. So some of you might re recall this Calvin and Hobbes um, comic strip, but uh, here uh, Calvin's being pushed in a wagon by Hobbes. It's true, Hobbes, ignorance is bliss. Once you know things, you start seeing problems everywhere. And once you see problems, you feel like you ought to try to fix them. And fixing problems seems to require personal change. And change means doing things that aren't fun. I say fooey to that. But if you're willy, willfully stupid, you don't know any better. So you can keep doing whatever you like. The secret to happiness is short-term stupid self-interest. <laughs> then Hobbes, we're heading for the cliff. I don't want to know about it. Ah! I'm not sure I can stand so much bliss. Careful, we don't want to learn anything from this. Unfortunately, I feel like that's largely our perspective of how we treat the environment. So my second piece here is about sins of creation. A number of years ago in a former church that I was a member of, they asked me to do a similar talk about uh, ecology during their Lenten speaker series. And I came across a really helpful book. Um, the book was called For the Beauty of the Earth by Stephen Boma Prediger. Um, the subtitle of the book is A Christian Vision for Creation Care. And one of the things that I found really surprising in that book is some of the rationale that he gave that we should care. And Boma Prediger argues that Christianity is in part to blame for our current environmental problems. That's a hard pill for us to swallow. Um, and I don't necessarily agree with all of his points, but I think it's a really interesting perspective that helps us understand where we're at and where we need to go. So first, much of his argument is in that reading of Genesis that we heard. So God created humankind in his image. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. So we're created in God's image and as such we're not a part of nature but we're separate from it. We've done really, really well in the be fruitful and multiply aspect, especially in the last 200 years. I mean, every three days we add the equivalent of Baltimore City's population to the planet. So we're continuing to expand. Uh, we're at 7.6 billion people on Earth right now. So be fruitful and multiply, we've done it. Um, so then God instructs us to subdue and have dominion over the Earth. It seems like we've taken that out of biblical context. If you read the rest of Genesis or the rest of the Bible and Jesus' teaching on how to care for the Earth and for the poor, we get a different picture than just subdue and have dominion. It's more of a stewardship message, one of caring for the earth. So uh, the second message or, or point in that book is that as Christians, we believe in the dualism of body and the spirit. And our emphasis tends to be on the latter. So because of that, we're primarily with, concerned with the salvation of our soul. And that means that sometimes we might think that our body and our time on earth isn't as important. So we don't need to do as much to care for creation as long as we get to be saved at the end. Third, he argues that the church has forgotten the creation. And that's primarily due to the connectedness between Christianity and Western culture. Christianity's influence on Western culture um, has forgotten about creation. We've allowed technology to become a god to us. It doesn't matter what happens now, technology will save us. Similarly, consumerism and economy has become like a god to us. Those things are more important to us as a society, as a Western culture. As an example of that, the United States as a country represents less than 5% of the world's population. But by most measures, 
we consume over 20% of Earth's resources. That's a huge disparity that contributes to the widening global gap between the rich and the poor. We abuse the natural environment for short-term material and economic gain, and that comes at the expense of long-term consequences. We fail to view this as a spiritual matter. So next in that same book, he outlines what some of our sins against creation are. And so I've kind of tried to update some of these sins against creation. And uh, just in the last year, we've had several major reports come out about the status, statuses of our environment. So this particular report comes from the Intergovernmental Science and Policy um, of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services. So it's an international body of several hundred uh, researchers, and they've explored um, how we've impacted nature. And I've summarized their points to uh, four relatively simple ones. Um, first, we depend on nature. Our well-being depends on nature. Second, nature is in severe decline. 25% of the plants and animals that they studied for this analysis are in threat of extinction. Another way that this has been stressed is that we're on the verge of another mass extinction. So over Earth's 4.6 billion year history, uh, there have been five major uh, mass extinctions, the last one being that of the dinosaurs. And conservation biologists suggest that we're on the verge of a sixth mass extinction, something that will mirror what happened with the dinosaurs. Okay. Um, my third point from this report is that uh, we're responsible for unprecedented global change. Uh, that global change is driven by human activity, and the five main categories that uh, we have there is habitat destruction and loss, species exploitation or harvesting, like overfishing, air and water pollution, the spread of non-native or exotic species, and increasingly climate change that magnifies those other things. So those are the five main things that I talk about in a lot of my classes. Human impacts on the environment, pollution, exploitation, habitat loss, non-native species, and climate change. And my fourth main point from this particular report is that our existing goals that we have for sustainability and biodiversity cannot be met without, quote, transformative changes across economic, social, political, technological factors. I think the key word in there is transformative. In other words, the status quo won't work. We need to transform how we go about things. So this report focused on kind of biodiversity and the status of nature. Uh, there were also four main reports that came out with respect to climate change. So on the left-hand side, this, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, or the IPCC. Again, it's another international body of scientists that study our impact on the climate system. And then the study on the right-hand side, this was one that was put out by our federal government, all of those studies paint a rather disturbing picture of the status of our climate. We've altered our climate system to uh, unbelievable ways. Um, some of those consequences include more extreme temperatures, bigger storms, rising sea levels, increased flooding, and other aspects. The United States report uh, states that, quote, climate change is transforming where and how we live and presents growing challenges to human health and quality of life, our economy, and the natural systems that support us. There is a fifth report that came out from the United Nations that found that we're unlikely to meet the Paris Agreement. If you're not familiar with the Paris Ag Agreement, this was a meeting of uh, a portion of the United Nations uh, in 2016, and they signed an agreement that uh, included almost 200 countries to help improve our climate situation. Um, 
the goal of the Paris Agreement was to keep global warming less than two degrees Celsius. This report that just came out said that um, we're not on track to do that. We're nowhere near that. Um, most countries are not on track to reduce their carbon emissions, which is the primary driver of climate change. Um, and perhaps worse than that, uh, our global carbon emissions are act actually went up last year. And if we continue on that same track, we're looking at three and a half degrees of warming by the end of this century. So the Paris Agreement, while trying to go in the right direction, the countries aren't living up to it and our impact continues to increase. Adding to this problem, adding to these sins against creation, is who pays the heaviest price. Generally, it's not us. Generally, it's the poor and the disadvantaged. They're the ones that have to deal with the brunt of our pollution, the worst of the impacts of climate change, whether in this country or globally. Recognition of this environmental racism grew out of the uh, civil rights movement in the 60s, helping to raise awareness about the communities that face these public health threats. In short, those that create the problems are not the same communities that suffer the worst consequences. So my third piece then is about environmental stewardship. So what do we do with all of this? What is our role as Christians? Well, in the United Methodist Church, we're lucky because our book of discipline gives us some guidance. Doesn't mean that we necessarily follow it, but the guidance is there. So uh, in our uh, Methodist Book of Discipline, the social principles of, in the Book of Discipline has a whole section on the natural world. And it states in part, all creation is the Lord's and we are responsible for the ways in which we use and abuse it. Water, air, soil, minerals, energy resources, plants, animal life, and space are to be valued and conserved because they are God's creation and not solely because they are useful to human beings. God has granted us stewardship of creation. We should meet this stewardship duties through acts of loving care and respect. Let us recognize the responsibility of the church and its members to place a high priority on changes in economic, political, social, and technological lifestyles to support a more ecologically equitable and sustainable world leading to a higher life for all of God's creation. Now the Book of Discipline goes on to look at some of those things in a little bit more detail, but there's a clear call in our denomination to be better stewards of God's earth. So what do we do about this? Uh, well, I'm going to make this, I'm going to simplify this a little bit. But this is a fantastic article. So it's Susan Bratton, she's a professor. Um, she has two PhDs and another master's degree. She's the um, <laughs> a wonderful example of an academic overachiever. And she highlights, well, these are seven things that we should do. I'm going to simplify a little bit and give us just, just three things that, that we can do. And really, the children's message summarized the first two quite well. So first, we need to be aware. We have to have an awareness of what nature is, what exists in God's creation. To do this, we need to get outside. We need to experience nature. So like the kids, we need to go climb on rocks or go for a bike ride, go for a hike. We need to learn about the plants and the animals. Another aspect of this is that we need to learn and be aware of how nature benefits us. In the ecology world, we call these ecosystem services. Ecosystem services are things that nature does that we benefit from. Things like trees filtering the air, like trees increasing our property values, wetlands filtering water. Nature does all that all on its own. Third, we need, to, we need awareness of our impact on nature. Ignorance is bliss, but we need to get beyond that. We need to consider our own impact on, on nature, not only personally, but as a society. 
We need to pay attention to what's going on in the world and understand what the environmental impacts of that is, what those, um, what's going on in the world. Uh, we need to use this awareness to draw us closer to God. So be aware, get out, experience nature, and for me personally, some of the times that I have felt closest to God are times that I've been out submersed in nature. So we have to be aware, and um, that awareness can lead to appreciation. So if we're aware of nature and all these different aspects of it, uh, we need to learn to appreciate it. So we might not always appreciate rain and mud on a Sunday morning, or we might not just tolerate the rain and the mud on a Sunday morning, but we need to appreciate it. We need to appreciate God's creation that makes that rain possible. The importance of that rain in helping our plants grow, providing the food that we eat. We need to take joy in creation. We need to take joy in the intricate web of life and find awe and wonder in God's creation. One of the neatest ways that I've seen this practiced is at this World Council of Churches. I had the opportunity to travel to Europe a number of years ago, and on that trip we visited the ecumenical, ec ecumenical center of this World Council of Churches in Geneva, Switzerland. And uh, so their slogan is oikumene. Oikumene means the whole inhabited the earth. And in th so that encompasses the idea that we need to serve human needs, but we also need to care for God's creation. And one of the things that I really liked about this ecumenical, ecumenical center is their chapel. Their chapel is surrounded by glass walls to serve as a reminder to the worshipers there that we are a part of nature. We're not boxed off from nature. We are a part of God's creation. Okay, so we need to be aware, we have appreciation, and then lastly, we need to practice stewardship. We are called to honor God as creator in such a way that Christian environmental stewardship is part of everything that we do. We are called to be stewards of God's creation, representing God's interests, and to share God's blessings with other humans. We need to interpret Genesis as a sacred call to this stewardship instead of domination. We've been given a divine appointment as caregiver, so this creation stewardship will improve our ability to better care for the poor and the disadvantaged and our future generations. So how do we put this into practice? Well, I'm guessing that we're all familiar with the basics, you know, perhaps the three R's, reduce, reuse, recycle, but we need to think bigger than that. We need to think not only what we can do personally, but what we can do as a church, what we can do as a community, as a country, as a world. We need to live up to our roles as Christian stewards of the creation as we consider not only how we live, but how our communities act. We need to get outside, we need to contem contemplate creation and be good stewards of the environment, ensuring a safe and healthy future for all of us. Thanks.